meet for our finance meetings and we come out of our meetings laughing and people are like, what did you just come out of? If, if I told them finance meeting, they go, you're crazy. No one ever is excited to walk out of those. But you heard what Brian finished up on. We get in order to give. Right? Enough for us, more for others. If that means blessing somebody in our, bo- our family here, we're going to do it. If it means blessing somebody in our, in our backyard, we're going to do it. If it means blessing somebody overseas, we're going to do it. We have the means. Now we're looking for the opportunities. And praise God to be in a place like that. And here we are in July, and you guys are excuse me, kicking butt when it comes to finances. This is awesome. A lot of churches this summer year are begging their people. And you know what? I've never had to beg you guys because so many of you get it. And so my encouragement to you, what Brian said, just start doing something. Move. Start testing God in this area that he invites you to test him in. And listen to the words of C.S. Lewis. You know it gets serious when you start quoting C.S. Lewis. He goes, I don't know what the rule is as far as amount to give, but he goes, I know the only safe rule is to give more than you can spare. Amen? Let's stand for the reading of God's word this morning. 1 John chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Father, be glorified in this time, in this hour. Engage our hearts and our minds Show us the beauty of your love for us poured out through Jesus Christ to transform us so that we would know a joy beyond any earthly joy. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Have a seat if you would. So, the, the early church, after Jesus and, you know, you got the early disciples, grew like crazy. And for 300 years, there is this trajectory of growth of people's lives being transformed by the, by the love of Christ. And so many Roman leaders, so many Roman emperors came along and said, how do we stop this thing? How do we stop the growth of the early church? And one Roman emperor said it so perfectly Because he put his finger on the very thing that was causing the growth, and it was this, their love for each other. And his command to his leaders, to his military powers was this, your goal is to out-love the Christians. That's how we stop this thing. And yet, they failed to do that. Because the church has continued to grow for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Why? Because the key ingredient that God uses to transform lives and to change the world is that word love. And it's a topic that deserves a re-examination. Because it is easy to lose sight of how Not only do we love God, but how we love each other. And this is the beauty of this letter, 1 John, that we get to dive into together. Because it is all about, once again, re-examining where we're at in our love for God and our love for each other. Because I'm going to tell you, if you get the love piece wrong, you're going to get everything wrong. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, right? 
love is patient, love is kind, blah, blah, blah. Well, just before that, he says, if you try to do all these wonderful things and yet have not love, you are empty. Love is important. Love is critical. And unless you understand the love that God has for you, you will never know and understand the love we are able to give and receive from one another. This is the message of, of 1 John. And through that love and understanding God's love for us and our love for each other, there's confidence that builds in our life. And there's one thing I know as I talk to people journeying with Jesus in this world is that, boy, we need a constant reassurance of, am, am I doing the right thing? Am I following the right God? Am I practicing the right religion, right? Just the other day, my 10-year-old son was in the passenger seat of the car, and he said, Dad, how do we know we're worshiping the right God? 10 years old! I'm like, dude, I just want to listen to Def Leppard. Can we have this conversation later? <laughs> Not really. It was Metallica, but that's another, another topic for another time. And you know, it was just great because here's a 10-year-old heart that wants to love Jesus, wants to pursue Christ, who needs assurance, right? Who needs to know that there's confidence that God gives to those who, who are eager for him, who want to seek him. And so First John comes along, right? This beautiful letter, 105 verses, five chapters. And I just think to myself, what a better topic. What, a, what, what better book is there perhaps right now for us just to be encouraged in than First John? So if you haven't turned there yet, turn to First John. We're going to look at the first four verses. Take out your outline. You're going to follow along with some very important notes this morning. But before we dive into these four verses, let me give you a little background about who wrote this, let me give you a clue. Well, let me ask you, who do you think wrote the book of 1 John? You guys all get an A for the class. Good job. So, you know what's cool about John is he's like the apostle of love, right? Wouldn't that be cool, like your title's the apostle of love? Like you expect Barry White to come on at this moment and be like, yeah, girl, you know what I'm saying? Turn on that bubble machine, whatever. So here's the Apostle of Love writing this letter, and he knows something about love because this is a guy who followed Jesus. He was with Jesus. When Jesus says, come follow me, John left his job, he left his home, and he went and followed Jesus, and he got to be a part of Jesus' band of disciples for three plus years. And so you need to understand that he's the son of Zebedee, he's the brother of James. But I want you to understand two titles that really make, make John just such a lovable character. In the Gospel of John that he wrote, so he wrote five letters in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the epistles of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. I call them epistles. Some people call them postcards of the New Testament. They're just the little writings, you know what I'm saying? But he also wrote the book of Revelation. But in the Gospel of John, he never calls himself John. You know how he addresses himself in the Gospel of John? The one that Jesus loved. Think about that. Like, he saw his life through the lens of, of this Lord, this Savior, this King of Kings, that he saw himself as somebody beyond the earthly name given to him by his parents. He saw himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Imagine if you went through life viewing yourself in, in that regard. Like, what's your name? Well, let me just start by telling you I'm the one that Jesus loved. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like, doesn't that just change how you view yourself, because so many times we do view ourselves through the lenses of those that we deem important. And sometimes we view ourselves through my mom's lens or my dad's lens or my best friend's lens or my boss's lens. And sometimes we can get really like, uh, we can go into territory that's just not healthy for, our, for our, our, our character and our esteem. But if you saw yourself the way God sees you in Christ, you are the one Jesus loved. But let's we go into warm fuzzy territory where you know it's all it's all mushy love kind of topic he's also called by jesus the son of thunder which means this he had a temper he got angry right like so he's not only the one jesus loved but he's also the son of thunder 
And so for, for all of us here, there's, a, there's a quite a spectrum there where we all go, amen. I can re- find myself somewhere in that, in that spectrum. But the good news is he experienced the love of God, and now God has called him to be this messenger of love to the world. And that's what's so important about this letter, 1 John. See, the gospel of John was written so that you would have eternal life. This is written so that you would know the confidence and the assurance that you have eternal life. See, there's, there's a methodology to God that he knows exactly what we need. So he not only points you in the right direction, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. But as you journey with Jesus, we need confidences along the way. That's why 1 John's given to us. So we look at these first four verses of the 105 that we're going to tackle over the next 14, 15 weeks. So we're going to do this up to Christmas time. And I believe that God will use this powerfully in our lives to build our confidence and our assurance that we are, we're on the right path. And maybe along the journey, God might speak to your heart and tell you, you thought you were on the right path, but you were never really on the right path. He deals with truth and falsehood and deceit and lies. And his concern is, boy, are you worshiping the right God? And by worshiping the right God, you're going to manifest a certain lifestyle that's going to be honorable to him. And so we dive into this, this text and We look at three points this morning. There is a life to experience. There is a life to know. And there's a life to share. And these are important themes to start this letter. So you notice the first verse. Notice the first phrase. What was from the beginning? Stop right there. Because in the Bible, there are three beginnings. Who wants to guess the first one? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. Stop right there. This is what we call the creational beginning. Genesis 1, 1. Right? We have this very first book in our Bible, and it starts in the beginning, God. It assumes the the presence of God, but what the writer of Genesis gives us is a creation account. Out of nothing, God created something. Now, we're not going to go into all the sciences behind this and cosmology, and, but what we need to understand is that we live in a universe. It, it is a universe that communicates design. It communicates intelligence. You study how the, the planetary system exists in its, in its orbit and how the Earth is tilted on its axis and why are we the only planet that is designed for life because we have yet to find life elsewhere even though scientists are trying to explore the 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 cosmos and if we're not talking about the macro universe we're talking about the micro universe how do we make sense of the things that we can't see with the human eye within each and every single person what makes humans different than other species and etc 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 And we have to understand that Genesis 1 gives us the creation account. Six days God created, he rested on the seventh. Genesis chapter 2, he goes into more detail about what was created. So, God is this amazing creator and designer and sustainer. So we have this creational beginning. And what I would say to you is that you're not here because of sheer accident. There is, there's a deliberateness of our existence. Even our consciences tell us this. But there's a second beginning you need to understand from John chapter 1, verse 1. And we're going to call this the timeless beginning. Notice the quotes. Because John 1 says, The word was. Right In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. So now John says there's another beginning, and it goes, it goes before anything was ever created. And this tells us about the uncaused cause of all things, and that is God. 
Did you guys know God never had a beginning? God has always existed. And so here's the unbeginning beginning. So now all of a sudden, John takes us back before anything was ever created and then tells us about this eternal God who not only existed, but existed in a Trinitarian way, meaning Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't worship three gods, amen? One's hard enough. We worship one God who makes himself known in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And for all eternity, this one God has existed in perfect community with himself. He didn't create as if he lacked something. He didn't create because he needed us. He created the world and mountains and trees and us to showcase his glory. He's a, he's a God who's, whose renown encompasses the earth. We look at the cosmos, we go to the Grand Canyon, and we stand and we are speechless because you and I know we can't take credit for any of this stuff. We chalk it up to a God who is an amazing designer. And we sit there and go, wow, and this God is an uncreated being. Why is this important? Because our third beginning is where we experience life. This is what I will call the experiential beginning. Because you have creation. You've got a God who has always been. Perfect communion unto himself. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But all of a sudden, he sends a rescuer to save humanity from their sins. So that those who were once distant and alien and rebels and disobedient who don't want God can now be brought into God's family. So he says, I would rather die for you than live without you. And this is something that must go beyond our minds into our hearts, thus our experience to know that you've been loved with a love from from another place. Why is this important? Because creation is not enough. And, and to have a God who would just not love us to save us, but he loves us to save us, that now we get to experience something, and that experience happens the moment you say no to yourself and yes to him. The experience happened in my heart in 1985 when I was 15 years old. The experience of me trying to run from God and realizing that the hound of heaven is far more powerful than my rebellious spirit captured me, seized me, and said, I'm going to turn your life around and now you're going to live in a trajectory where you're going to experience something that this world cannot describe. And that is new life in Christ. The very life God has designed each and every person to experience. Now, whether that person experiences that new life is a whole nother question. But this is why this is written. What was from the beginning has now been made manifest to us. And so God says, and I want you to experience this. So I read this story a couple weeks ago of this woman in Indiana who literally days before her wedding calls off the wedding and we don't know why she never gives a reason why she's called the wedding but days before she calls every family member every friend to tell them the wedding's off she says in an interview she's crying between every call and not only calling friends and family and sobbing because she's calling off the wedding But she's also realizing that a lot of the things she has secured for the wedding cannot be refunded. The hotel, the ballroom, the tables, the coverings, the food, all this stuff, DJ. And she's sitting there going, you know what? (laughs) I'm not going to waste this money. $30,000 spent. I mean, I shudder because I got a 12-year-old daughter. And I'm going, you're not getting married until you're 40 because I need that time to save up money. 30000 That might be cheap. I know it's Indiana. It's not Arizona. But 30000 bucks. No one wants to f- just flush that away. 
So she says to her parents, I don't want to waste this. So what I want to do is I want to contact as many homeless shelters in the community I can and invite them to a night that is going to bless their socks off. So all of a sudden, she invites 170 total strangers from local homeless shelters to come to the nicest hotel in Indianapolis, to sit at the nicest tables in Indianapolis, to have an exquisite dinner, to eat wedding cake, and to dance the night away to a DJ, and people she doesn't even know. (laughs) And I just sit there and go, that's awesome. Because there's something so valuable, she says, I'm not going to waste this. And she reaches out to those who are undeserving and invites them to the banquet, to the celebration. And you better believe that that is a night that those people will never forget. And I can't help but think there's a banquet that men and women are being invited to. And you know who's throwing the party? It's Jesus. And you know who he doesn't want to leave out? You. And you're probably thinking, why, why would he invite me? Why, why would he want me? Why, why is this important? Because he says, well, I'm the one who's actually created you. Your very existence is due to me and my sovereignty and my power. And then he says to us, yeah, you don't deserve it. And you probably realize that. But you need to know that the invitation stands. Come to the party. And eat like you've never eaten before and dance like you've never danced before and celebrate something good that you will never be able to repay. That is the experience. That is worth celebrating. That is what gives us a little giddy up in our lives, right? Because we've been loved with a love we know we don't deserve. But praise God, he's a God full of grace and mercy and compassion and kindness. Is that not awesome? Which brings us to our second point. It's a life he wants you to know. Because notice what John says. What was from the beginning, and that what is really a person. And the the theme I want you to understand as we dive into these next couple verses is that he's a God who doesn't hide himself. He's not a God who's like... I'm over here and then hides and you can't find him and you get all crazy and frustrated. And he's a God who John says, we've heard him. We've seen him. We've we've touched him with our hands. This word of life, this life was manifested. Made visible, revealed. And we have seen and hear and bear witness proclaiming this eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us. Stop right there. Three things. This is such a remarkable thing about our God. He's a God who wants to be known. And I'm not telling you just about an intellectual knowledge of this God, but He's a God who invites you to hear Him, to watch Him, and to touch Him. He's a God who who chooses not to love people from a distance, but has immersed himself in our messy, dirty world and says, listen to me, watch me, and if if you want, come close to me and touch me. Think about this God who was touched. Think about this this Jesus, 100% divine, 100% God, 100% human, He didn't lose any of his divinity when he came to dwell among us, and yet he led with the human peace because he had to subject himself to the very lives that you and I experience on a daily basis. In order to be the perfect substitute for us to ultimately go to the cross and pay the price that we needed to pay but we could never pay, he did for us. But think about how many people came along and touched Jesus. The woman bleeding uncontrollably just touches the hem of his garment and is healed. Think about the, the, the spit that Jesus puts in the dirt and makes the mud and puts that on the blind man's eyes and all of a sudden he washes away and he can see. Think about the contact that this God chooses to have with us. I mean, I knew a guy one time who feared another person touching him 
that he had a hard time going to the barber. He had to work through so many internal issues that he didn't want somebody touching his head to cut his hair. And we don't know where that comes from, but all of, a, all of a sudden, I just realized that there's a God who says, I want to get involved in your mess and your dirtiness. And I'm not going to judge you, and I'm not going to condemn you. I'm going to come and set you free and show you something you've never experienced before. Who does not want to worship a God like that? I mean, I've traveled around the world. I've seen some pretty amazing places specifically religious temples and religious places where you know it the god is is distant he is untouchable uh you can't go near the religious leaders every there's a there's a chasm that exists between the the person and the deity the god whatever and all i know is that there's a god and his name is jesus he says i invite you to come near me there's nothing to be afraid of there's nothing to be ashamed of there's nothing to be fearful of. He knows everything about us and still invites us to be close to him. The woman standing naked in Jesus' presence, just taken from the bed of, of adultery, right? She's standing naked. I'm wondering where the guy is she was sleeping with, right? This is how horrible that culture was towards women, but there she is trying to cover herself up, and there are people that are ready to judge her and condemn her. And Jesus just confronts him with this amazing wisdom and says, you know what, if you're here and you've got no issues in your life, you're just perfect, you've got no sin, go ahead, just throw the stone. And for the oldest and youngest, they all drop the rocks and leave because they all realize that they have issues in their own life. And here's this woman who stands naked and it's just her and Jesus, right? And he says, where are those who are trying to condemn you? She says, they're not here. But almost in her mind, she's probably thinking, but you're here, what are you going to do? And he says, go and sin no more, i.e., I'm going to set you free. Because those guys had no right to condemn you, even though they tried, but I have every right to condemn you, and I'm going to choose not to. Why? Because I'm a God who wants you to know my love. What? (laughs) This is awesome! And so Jesus says, go and sin no more. Even the disciple Thomas, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, had his doubts. If you ever come across a person who loves Jesus and says doubting is a sin, you know what, kick him, in, kick him upside the head, if you would. There's nothing wrong with doubting. It is not a sin. So long as those doubts encourage you to explore and discover answers, but here, Thomas, he says to the disciples, well, I don't, I'm not going to believe you guys. Unless Jesus is right here and I touch his wounds, I'm not going to believe. Poof, there's Jesus. Thomas, you were saying? <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Like, and Thomas, even though Jesus gave him the invitation, go ahead, touch my wounds. The presence of the risen Jesus was enough for him to fall on the ground and say, my Lord and my God. Praise God that he doesn't hide from us. Praise God he doesn't reveal himself yet at a distance. Praise God that he loves us up close and personally. And he just invites you. As you walk with him, there's a vitality of relationship that says, not only are we allowed to hear God, Not only are we allowed to see God, but we are allowed to touch Him. There's a mystical edge to what I'm describing because Jesus is not here. So we can't really hear Him, see Him, or touch Him like the early disciples did. But in a sense, is there a spiritual union that could give us the same experience? I think so. I think so. Like, if you close your eyes and you l- just imagine the words of Christ, picture a scene in your mind, I mean, you can come pretty close to experiencing the, the vital presence of Jesus that they had that we, have to, that we can have today. I think the Spirit can do something like that. 
There's times when I'm reading something or I'm explaining something to you, and I just get goosebumps. Because it's almost like God has given us enough to see it, to, to hear it, to taste it, to touch it. And that's why I think the psalmist says, taste and see and know that the Lord is good. There's something in our vital relationship, union with Christ, that gives us this. Because John is saying, I was there. And it is awesome. It is a wonderful thing. And so, perhaps we need to become more engaged with the writings, perhaps to not leave them as just sterile words on a page, but, but help, ask God to help us to breathe some life into what he says to us. Because we do need to hear, and we do need to see, and we do need to touch. And however the Spirit needs to manifest that, all glory goes to God. Because he's a God who wants us to know him. And by that no, I want you to write the word intimacy. Because here's what I'm not asking you guys to do. I'm not asking you to recite a creed. Sign off on a doctrinal statement. You ever been to a church, been a part of a church? Just go ahead and sign here. You're now a part of the church, you know. He, he's, he's not asking you to believe certain things, doctrines about Jesus, though those are important. John is inviting you into a relationship with a person. Because you need to understand, everything stands or falls on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And if that sounds exclusivistic, it is. If that sounds narrow-minded, it is. If it sounds like, oh, you're just not loving towards the Muslims and the Buddhists and the Hindus and the atheists. I love them, but they don't, they're not believing correctly. Well, that, you're, just, you're just an idiot. The beauty of the message of Christ is when you're faithful to his teaching, you can remove yourself as the messenger because it's the message that he has communicated. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. It sounds pretty exclusivistic. I mean, if you've got an issue, take it up with that guy. Jesus, you're so narrow. I mean, many people found his teaching hard. Why? Because we really want a salad buffet, potluck, general kind of faith in life. Come to the table and bring whatever God you want. One of my favorite sequences, sequences, parts of the, I, I love Stephen Colbert, and I love the Colbert Report, is when he had the wheel of gods, and he basically pitted two gods against each other on the show. Do you guys remember that? Okay, we'll skip that illustration. So on to the next point. <laughs> There's one God, and this one God has no rivals. He will prove himself sovereign. He will prove himself powerful. And none can come close because all other gods, little g's, are subservient to the one true God who rules over all. And yet Jesus stands supreme above all other faiths and religions and gods. Because only he claimed to be God and backed it up through his miracles. And the greatest of that is the resurrection. And people today are still scratching their head going, how do we explain this? Well, sometimes you just can't. You have to accept it. Read the book of Hebrews sometimes. Shows you the supremacy of Christ. Amen. Last point. It's not only a life to experience. It's not only a life to know but it's also a life to share. And by share, there's two avenues I want us to share this life. With each other, what we call the church, and with those that are not part of the church that live in the world. See, John says in verse 3 and 4, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim. There's something we vocalize, there's something we communicate, there's something we shout from the rooftops. That we have fellowship. Now that seems like an archaic word. 
I mean, I was on staff at a Baptist church. Yes, and I'm still saved, believe it or not. I still love the Lord. It didn't ruin me. But the church had a fellowship hall. Anyone ever been a part of a church that had the fellowship hall? Like, you kind of looked at it like, is that where the Ark of the Covenant is kept? Is that where the Holy of Holies is? I mean, do, am I allowed to go in there? Like, you've got all the other buildings, but on campus there's the fellowship hall. Like, oh, what happens there? Fellowship? Well, what is that? Like, I think about certain terms we use, and the world's like, fellowship? What's that? Well, the idea of what happens in the fellowship hall is there's connection, and connection usually involves food, which is one of my spiritual gifts, eating. And so when you're there in the fellowship hall and you're eating and you're, you're talking and you're engaging, there's something happening that is special, that is rich, that is wonderful. But the moment you leave fellowship hall, the fellowship stops. And we're like, when's the next potluck? When can I have the next bean salad with potato chips crumble all over the top? I mean, when's that going to happen? And I think... We've had this idea of fellowship hijacked from the church. See, the idea of fellowship is, is this word where we have all things in common. Not fellowship only happens for an hour and a half after Sunday services in that special building over there. Fellowship is something that we experience because, number one, there's a foundational bond that we have Christ. See, this is why John says, our fellowship was with the, the Father and the Son and ultimately the Spirit, and now we have something in common. So we may have our differences of, of shows we like, of movies we see, music we listen to, clothes we wear, cars we drive. Yeah, there's a lot of differences, but the one thing that bonds us, that makes our fellowship unlike any other fellowship in the world, is that we have Jesus. And I'll tell you what, if you have Christ, and you're willing to engage in relationship, there's nothing that could stand in the way of our friendship with each other. Too many people are dying on hills of opinions and values that don't matter in time and eternity. Think about how many friendships were ruined over this last election. Because the moment you put out who you're voting for, guess what? You're excommunicated from that relationship. I sit there and go, really? Are we not men enough or women enough to say, you know what, you may differ from me, but you know what, we have Christ. I mean, there's something wonderful about the spiritual union. Have we not been baptized by one spirit? Have we not been baptized into one salvation? Have we not been given eternal life through one God, one Savior? His name is Jesus. And if we have those wonderful gifts and blessings from God that we can never earn from ourselves, are we not part of a family that this world can never break apart? You may differ. When it comes to speaking in tongues, you may differ according to Bible translations. Those are not hills that I'm going to die on. We can agree to disagree, but make sure you don't disagree disagreeably. We live in a culture where people are really fighting stupid battles. I think God is in the heavens and he laughs at us. He says, really, you're, you're bothered over this? You're, you're losing sleep over this? You want to know what you should be losing sleep over? It's the fact that you have Jesus and there's somebody in your life who doesn't. And they need to be invited to the banquet. This is why this is written. So that we could have something rich in our relationship and that we're bothered by those who don't have what we have together. Which means, if we're truly in love with Christ, there's something definitive about our connection with each other. That we love one another. And this is not just a, an, a, 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 a fact about love. This is the experience of love. And I want you to know that, boy, the Lord continues to teach me 
the importance of being a pastor. And it's not, it's not leading from a distance, but it's being involved in your life. Can I tell you, last night I had a, a, a phone call, 45-minute phone call, with a, with a husband who really is just having a hard time loving his wife. You see, at 9 o'clock on Saturday night, I'm trying to figure out what I'm speaking on Sunday morning. See, that's what I'm doing with my time. Just kidding. If you ever go out with me on a Saturday night, I'm like, I got to go home and figure out what I'm speaking on in the morning. (laughs) But here I am on a Saturday night. My boys are in bed. My wife's here building relationships at Sozo. And I'm 45 minutes on the phone with a guy who's having a hard time loving his wife. And you know what? That's fellowship in the sense of it's not, hey, just want to call and just shoot the breeze with you. I'm not just calling to, hey, how those D-backs doing? You know, what do you think about what's going on in, you know, the Middle East? Blah, blah, blah. Those are, those are important things. But what's more important is that this brother needed encouragement. And when you become a collective body of people that go beyond the surface and you start, start truly caring for each other and asking each other, how's your marriage? How's your, how's your spiritual life? How's your journey with Jesus? How are you doing with your work? I know you've had some struggles there. I mean, when we come together and connect at a level where most people are not engaging us, that is rich. And that's why the early church were loving each other so much, they were making a difference in people's lives. That's why the Roman authorities were going, how do we outlove these people? Because Jesus says, the world's going to know you're my disciples by your love for each other. When is your love for Christ and each other going to go beyond Sunday morning 9 to 10, 15? When is your love for the people around you going to go beyond uh, 10, 45 to 12, in case you're a second service person usually? When's your love for somebody going to go beyond the next church event? When is it going to be just a sensitivity to the Spirit to say, I saw that guy and it looked like he was emotionally distraught. I'm going to go take him out to lunch. When's it going to be the person that, you know, I don't know them, but I want to talk to them and just be like, how can I pray for you? Because we're becoming more fragmented in our world. Facebook, Zuckerberg, if you guys aren't familiar, there's this cool thing called the Facebook out there. And, uh, He just came out in an interview where he says, basically, I would love for Facebook to almost replace the church. Like, I want this to be such a a platform for for relationships that people really don't want to go to, you know, this this activity anymore, this church or this or this. And I'm sitting there going, Zuckerberg doesn't understand some core theological principles. Number one is Jesus will build the church and the gates of hell will not stand against it, right? Amen? Amen. But that we as a people understand, while Facebook could be a tool used for so many great things, as like the people viewing this video right now, I talk to counselors who tell me ever since social media, Facebook, whatever, has taken off over the past decade, the amount of clients he's seen, marriage couples, parents, children, friends, and the, and the damage that this stuff has done because we think we're having relationship when we're really not. He says, it's off the chart. Like that buddy of mine years ago who said, uh, I'm like, hey, how you doing? What's going on? He's like, what, you haven't read my Facebook post lately? <laughs> I'm just like, you <laughs> We need to get out of that mentality and understand the importance of face-to-face connection. Jesus came. We heard him. We saw him. We touched him. How can we spiritually touch each other? I don't want that to sound creepy. Some of you are like, ooh, I'm looking forward to touching other people. Like, No. Come here, you. It's been wanting to touch you forever, right? Like, but you know what? There's something wonderful about a hug. There's something wonderful about just someone saying, you know what? I appreciate you. And, and to have that c- contact eye to eye. 
there's something wonderful about this. And this is something that the more we grow in, the world says, tell me more about this. Because we're not talking about joining a fraternity or sorority or a boys or girls brigade and pioneer girls club or whatever. We're talking about the church, the place where rebellious, disobedient, messy people come together and just try to figure out this thing called life. And don't you dare put me on a pedestal, my wife on a pedestal, thinking like, oh, you're the pastor and pastor's wife. You guys got to figure it out wrong. I could probably tell you on all my fingers and toes how many times I yelled at my children this week. You did what? Yeah, because I'm a human being. But I'm ever trying to live as one who's dependent upon God. So if you see this as a hospital and not a country club, you're in the right place. If you see this as a place where I can really genuinely connect with people and grow in my spiritual walk and love for God and, and learn how to love other people, you're in the right place. Because there's two things I know is that a community, the church combats loneliness and there's a joy that God offers that combats emptiness. We are more connected as a society, but we're more lonely than ever. These things have been written, verse 3, so that you might have genuine community. Amen? And these things have been written, verse 4, that you might have joy. There's the word. And there's... There's a joy that God offers us where we feel whole and alive and, and, and there's purpose that goes beyond our hobbies and our luxuries and our jobs and our relationships. Guys, I know how hard it is to not try to find your significance in your career. Ladies, I don't know what it's like to try to find, you know, uh, if you're trying to find your significance in your career or your relationships or whatever, but all of us have a misplaced understanding of thinking that this world is going to satisfy us, and God says you were never created to have this world satisfy you, you were created to have me satisfy you. If you find in yourself desires that this world does not satisfy, perhaps you were made for another world. C.S. Lewis, again. Don't miss the order, and I close with this. Three things we've talked about this morning. Jesus. Relationships. Joy. The order is deliberate. You miss one, you're missing the whole plan of God for your life. You rearrange it, you're missing the whole plan of God for your life. The foundation is Jesus. The experience is relationships. The reward is joy. So many people, why am I not feeling it? Why am I not getting what you're describing? Well, do you have Jesus? <laughs> That's critical. But usually the piece of relationships what miss, is what missing. It's what's missing. We need God and we need each other. And the more we explore life before God with one another, the more there's joy that comes out of that. And this is what's going to be unpacked as we go through First John together. Is that good? I've cried once again. I have no Kleenex in my pocket. My nose is running. And you know what? I love it because this is me, a pastor who loves you guys, who doesn't have it all together. But you know what? I'm determined to press on to in the right direction, and I'm just glad you guys are willing to come along. Amen? Stan, let's pray. Oh, Lord, you are awesome. 
I can't help but get away from the fact that you have loved us up close. I mean, there's so many of us here who, who don't even look at ourselves in a mirror. And yet you're a God who knows us through and through and still chooses to love us. That is incredible. And because of that love you poured out in our hearts through Jesus, you've asked us to journey in this thing called life together. Continue to allow us to to see and understand what that looks like. Allow us to go beyond Sunday morning together. Allow us to journey Monday through Saturday in this thing called life as we, as we seek Jesus together, may we journey together and encourage one another and strengthen one another. And Lord, the beautiful thing is the result of that is going to be a joy. Oh, Jesus himself says, I have come to bring you joy and a fullness of joy that no one else could offer. We want that, God. But help us to not want that without wanting Jesus and each other. So Lord, guide our steps, direct our hearts, engage our minds, and may you be glorified in all that's said and done. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace and mercy forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great week, all right?